Welcome to the show. It's an honor to have you here today. So <clears throat> let's start. Let's start a little bit about the history, about your personal history. Um, I. Why did you choose the courses, your courses and study? How did you become interested in the many areas that you are? Uh, it, it's a good story. I, I have studied quite a bit and in different modes, but they all intersect, at least in my world they do. Uh, I started off uh, as a, a freshman at Harvard and uh, I wanted to actually to major in world religions, but that major did not exist yet. And uh, I offered the dean to help uh, create such a major. Uh, I got laugh laughed out of the office uh, and um, decided to major in something called folklore and mythology. It was the first year it had been ever offered on the Harvard campus. and. Uh, through it, ended up back in classes at Harvard Divinity School. Uh, my health interfered uh, in my third year, and I finished that degree uh, at uh, New York University in a more general um, theme of cultural anthropology. Uh, and that way, uh, that, uh, get another view uh, of the subject of oral tradition and storytelling in terms of society. And uh, it has been part of my communication teaching ever since. Uh, the, um, the major or the master's degree in urban planning is something I also designed. It was in uh, arts and culture and economic development back in the 80s, which again, that didn't exist. Uh, so I created it. Uh, the um, religion, master's degree uh, is uh, something that I eventually got uh, many decades after Harvard. Uh, I continued to do my education uh, for quite some time, as you can see, uh, formally and even now informally. It's part of who I am. But it just kind of generated all options and possibilities with time. Okay, then, you know, to go back even a little bit further, you grew up in the Bahamas, correct? I mean, your life has been extraordinary, and so has your, your family. Yes. Yes, I, I actually grew up in Bermuda. Bermuda, I'm so which, sorry. Um, often mistaken for the Bahamas, <laughs> but it's a little further north. And uh, it, um, it, it, uh, at the time, it was a British colony. It's called the Commonwealth now. And so I went uh, to very British-oriented schools there until we came back to the States. Both of my parents were born in America. And actually, I was born in Brooklyn. Uh, but um, my, my uh, mother's family had moved to Bermuda in the early 1900s and is the, still the only Jewish family to have lived on the island for four generations. But uh, there's never been a synagogue or a rabbi in uh, long, long term there. So uh, my dad, who um, was is a first was a first generation born American, wanted us to have a Jewish community, and uh, we came back to New York. Well, long that's yeah, that's a long journey back and forth. Did you yes. were you did you experience? Um, uh, anti-Semitism there when you were growing up? How was it being kind of like aliens there? That's not something that was around, right? The Jewish yeah, community. That's true. So how was that for you? For the most part, it, it was uh, uh, fine. The only Jewish holiday that we celebrated really was Passover, uh, which was a huge community thing held at a local hotel or something, and we flew a rabbi in for it. But otherwise, um, it was uh, uh, interesting that my family was so embedded in the culture uh, that, we, for the most part, we were accepted. Um, the uh, during the World War II, we had hosted all the Jewish military coming through, and the Holocaust survivors that were on their way to the states post-war. Uh, so we had a role to play that most people couldn't play. And for that, we were given a certain amount of respect. 
And what are some of the stories that you heard? I mean, we all know what happened to the Jewish people uh, during the Holocaust. I'd like to hear some of those stories so people can really get an understanding. And there are people who don't believe there was even a Holocaust. I know, I know, it's very disturbing. Uh, I don't quite get it. Um, first of all, my father did not really talk about the Holocaust when I was younger. He had been, I knew he had been a soldier in the war, but it wasn't until I took the job uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, after the Oklahoma City bombing, that I found out the extent to which he had worked as a military intelligence officer assigned to interrogate Nazi prisoners of war, and that he, being a literary man, he graduated from Harvard, um, he, he kept all of his letters that he had written my mother and, and his papers and her letters to him in a file cabinet in his closet and then shared them with me so that I could learn more about what had happened. And the stories uh, that he that he shared were uh, hard to read. It's taken me, it took me years to get through those letters. Things like opening up a death camp and seeing thousands of bodies stacked up and the smell being unbearable. Um, of interviewing some of these people. I remember as a kid, when I, when I found out a little bit of what he did, I said, well, I, I said, well, Daddy, did you kill anybody in the war? And Daddy said, no, but I slapped somebody once. I said, you slapped somebody? What for? And he said, he just said that he wished that Hitler had killed more Jews than he did. And that was a hint that uh, he had a great many stories to tell. And when I was in Tulsa and he was worried about me being exposed to all of the neo-Nazi issues going around and I was being um, trained by the FBI in uh, security for the Jewish Federation where I worked, he jumped on a plane and came out and started to tell me some of these stories. And he... Um, was willing to go now on a radio show, which I arranged for him, to tell some of these stories. And that recording, this must be almost 30 years old now, is up on my American Diversity Report for people to hear so they understand, yes, this did happen. This is not fake news, guys. The Holocaust was real. Yes. You know, living in Los Angeles for a time, I met... It, it, this was a while back, because I don't know how many of these people are alive, but I met people who were in the Holocaust. They had the tattoos on their arms, and they told me some of the stories. And it's it's something that sticks with you, those stories. Yes, they do. And when I put up on, on Facebook that I was writing my memoir called The Liberator's Daughter about my dad and how he inspired me to do what I do now. I got a message from a total stranger uh, saying that she had the, uh, the memoirs of a Holocaust survivor. He had passed away. She was a nurse to him while he was ill. And she had promised him that he, she would get them published. Would I include them? So she mailed them to me. And uh, yes, I did. I included those letters, those memoirs in The Liberator's Daughter so people could get the first-hand understanding of what it was like. Mm -hmm. And when you were working at the Jewish organization, what did your job entail? Well, I've worked at several. The first time I started working uh, for them was in Chicago for the American Jewish Committee. I was hired to be their interreligious affairs director. I did their interfaith dialogues, and I ran the national workshop on Christian-Jewish relations. Um, this was in part because I had represented in Bermuda. I had gone to Harvard Divinity School and had a familiarity with um, the religious conversations that a lot of folks don't necessarily have. And so uh, I was inspired by that kind of work to create uh, my own organization in Chicago called the DuPage, DuPage County uh, Interfaith Resource Network. 
Uh, and that's when I started to write and do books, publish about my work. Okay. What I understand your parents were uh, writers themselves and had degrees in related studies. What, who, uh, I, under, I understand your family was an influence, but who was your favorite writer when you were younger? I'm sure there's a few. There are many. Um, I, I was able to learn to read when I was very, very young, like four years old. And uh, my mother encouraged me to read stories and fairy tales, especially the British ones uh, that were uh, all over the place in Bermuda. And she would later uh, publish um, a, a, an article in the Yale magazine about the influence of stories on bringing up children, which I I found out after she had passed away. I thought, yes, that's my mom. Um, and uh, one of the, the things that I did in reading was uh, on a small island to use it to travel the universe, right? With the poetry and biographies and uh, fables. And coming to America, um, my dad uh, took us to the library every weekend and insisted that we take out a book to read, whether we liked it or not. And if we didn't come across one, he would do it for us. And I, I read everything I could get my hands on. But one of the things that really impressed me was a gentleman by the name of Lawrence Durrell, the Alexandria Quartet, which is a rather esoteric group of books written on the basis of Einstein's uh, theory of relativity, time and space but it's just fun, fascinating. And it shaped how I looked at the world in multi-dimensional, you know, for all time. It was mm-hmm. uh, a process of mind, of thinking that became part of me. And apparently you have an IQ even higher than Einstein. Yes, um, I do. Uh, and uh, we took the IQ test in, in high school. And remember, I, I was brought up uh, in a very almost Victorian English uh, colony at the time. Uh, and in the 50s, women weren't supposed to be. Uh, so out there, genius. And I had brothers who were not. Uh, and my family, my parents had decided that I would best survive if I were humbler than most and understated. Uh, so uh, it was a long time before I would say anything about that uh, IQ. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It, it's a shame they don't have other areas of IQ testing. I know they have like the EQ, but something about Einstein that I'm sure most people have perceived at this point is his creativity, his his openness to all information because arrogance in my opinion, closes a person. When you're arrogant, you're not going to question your own ideas and you lose the ability to be creative and free-flowing. So creativity is a magical gift. So true, so true. And I'm, I don't know how many people understand that uh, Einstein was a, a very passionate musician, a violinist, uh, and uh, performed and it was a, a dear thing to him. Uh, and when I first came to America, my Amer- my parents arranged that I got violin lessons through the public school, which rented them out to kids for only five bucks a year and free lessons. I'm writing a, a, my next opinion column about that. We need to do more. Music is really important in developing intelligence. It just, it works different parts of the brain and stimulates different parts of the brain, just adding to the natural intelligence a person may have or developed intelligence, I should say. And there is something about learning to read and write at a young age. I did the same thing with my daughter. She's She was four and she had this, and the reason why is some people have this hunger, this energy, and, and they want to be stimulated. And, you know, she's, you know, honor, and I can brag, this is Mother's Bragging Rice. She <laughs> is uh, you know, on the, on the, in the Honor Society and did an academic, academic Achievement Award. And she's just so stimulated. And part of that's her personality, just this hungry 
thirst for information. Uh, but there is, I wish we could get kids, people think, oh, children aren't ready to read or write, with flashcards and slowly just running flashcards every day, like with letters and, and doing the pronunciation of the letter and, and then tying sentences together. And it, it's really not that difficult to do. I wish that, that society would encourage more of that. Oh, I absolutely agree. Uh, the the ability to read is 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 paramount, you know. To I think to success in life, uh, and uh, I remember my daughter, myself, uh, who is now fully grown, uh, would actually read in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I was one of those people who read in lines. I always had a book, you know, yeah. I was up at night, like not supposed to be up and I was reading a book and my daughter does it too. And in today's digital world, it makes me, it brings a smile to my face that some people still care about books. Well, you know, it has, there's something very uh, amazing about holding that book in your hands. And I remember being like maybe four years old and my parents had gone off to some party and the neighbor uh, who was like six foot four, Harry, uh, was left in charge of like, the, us kids. And it was dark. I snuck down to the kitchen, got some butterscotch pudding out of the refrigerator, snuck back into bed, pulled the covers over my head, got a flashlight. And I'm slurping up the, the, um, uh, the, the butterscotch pudding and reading, right, probably something like Peter Pan, Mm -hmm. and, and this huge man pulls off the covers and says, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> right. Yep. You can't stop people from reading the people that love books. <laughs> yeah. And so I want to get into, you know, you're a, you are listed as a Forbes magazine, a diversity and inclusion trailblazer. Why do you think you received that honor? So I started to work in the in the in the world of diversity very early on. In some ways, I think I, it was always part of me and being the only Jewish little girl on the island, right? Mm -hmm. Being the only little Bermudian in a, in the public school in Long Island, New York, uh, and then uh, going to uh, to Harvard uh, just when it merged with Radcliffe. Um, dealing with the um, the sort of reluctance of <laughs> some of the gentlemen uh, to have cliffies uh, on campus, and then um, the idea of of different religions was always there. So mm -hmm. the, the work that I've done in diversity has often been related to, uh, to my religious diversity work, but it also came from the arts. It, one of the beauties of the arts means that you can travel the world through music. And I did, you know, playing the violin and all different kinds of music. I also was a dancer different kinds of dance from all over the world it was so amazing. Art, yeah. Yeah. art has been part of your life always poetry you name it it has always been there and it always has part in in um, my teaching about diversity so when they say when people ask me when did you start you know your diversity work you know i i struggle a little bit to pinpoint a year, a time, but I would say that once I started working uh, for, on interreligious affairs for the American Jewish Committee, I was in that uh, arena, even though diversity wasn't yet a term that we used. I was really impressed and touched by the fact that you had experienced serious illnesses and can you expound upon that a little bit? Because this was a very serious problem for you when you were growing up. Yes. Um, it started very young, uh, even in Bermuda. Um, tremendous crazy allergies that uh, were debilitating. And we had no allergist on, on the island. Uh, so they had to take my blood and ship it to New York, inject somebody with it and test them. Um, 
And uh, I really feel sorry for that person <laughs> who got my blood because when I did arrive in America, I got every every single disease uh, that that I was exposed to: measles, mumps, chicken pox, German measles, scarlet fever, strep throat. Uh, my my immune system was off for sure, uh, and it it has often just led to very debilitating periods in my in my life. Um, as a teenager, I, I I was a dancer. I, I had I was the head of the dance company for the high school. I woke up one morning and couldn't walk. Mm. And uh, I've had other times when uh, it's been just so harsh. Uh, in particular, when I was part of, I was head of a Jewish federation here in Chattanooga, and I went on a mission and ended up in um, Uzbekistan, uh, mm. very sick, and uh, had to resign. I could not, I could not work. I couldn't even find my way home. Uh, it was pitiful. I had to figure out what else I was going to do with my life. The amazing thing is that, you know, that was 30 years ago, maybe 20, 20 years ago. These decades have been the most creative, productive time ever. You have, mm -hmm. to, have to think of it like that. That's right. With all these struggles that you had, a lot, I would say, a good portion of creativity comes from people who have had many struggles. And you were, you weren't able to participate in life in an active way. And I would imagine that's a good opportunity for you, for you to hone your skills in writing and studying. And I imagine that might be part of the case. Is that true for you? To some degree, at first, you know, you're just sort of uh, sitting there take, uh, taking up space. Your brain is not working. Your body isn't working. You don't know if it'll come back. Um, so it's not like you're taking time off to be creative. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it, is as, it, it, it did come back gradually in most cases. I, I had to rethink what I wanted to do with my life, what I could do, um, given the physical... Inconsistency, inconsistency, yeah, consistencies of your health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, I've had to reinvent myself. And people talk about that, you know, you really should be reinventing yourself every now and then. Um, and it may be true, uh, but I didn't choose it. <laughs> yeah, you you are forced to do that. That is true, though. When you reinvent yourself, it's actually stimulating to your mind, helps keep your mind young, and it makes life more interesting, I'd say. Yes, it's amazing what I have been able to do. Um, persevere. Stubborn. Mm -hmm. call it. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, yeah, stubborn, <laughs> stubborn means determination, in my opinion. Just determined. Well, I know that I went, I went on one television show one time and then we were talking about the, the 15 books that I've, I've written and published. And uh, I said, yes, I'm, I'm kind of, I persevere and I'm kind of stubborn. And then the, uh, the interviewer said, have you ever thought of it as actually being compulsive? <laughs> and I said, okay. I'll That's admit. another trait of successful people. <laughs> they are compulsive. Most, some of them have OCD and it's, hey, it can be served for something good. It serves as something that's that is that is good to have when you're when you're really driven. Okay, we'll be right back after this. The reviews for Extendivite are amazing. Here are some from Amazon. September 2018. 
Extendivite works in keeping my blood pressure in the normal range. I've been using Extendivite for many years now. May 2018. Great product. I use regularly and I rarely get sick. March 2018. This product has relieved what appeared to be angina pain in my chest and shortness of breath after climbing stairs. I'm quite happy about it. February 2018. My husband, son, and I have been using this product for a few months now, and we have noticed an improvement in our joints and blood pressure. Tell us your story. Get Extendivite today. To order, call 1-877-928-8822. That's 1-877-928-8822. Or visit heartdrop.com. Extend your life with Extendivite. So, you love talk radio. Then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on 24-7 with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. If you have hard water, the LimeScale not only leaves white spots, it clogs pipes and breaks down appliances, costing you hundreds of dollars in energy and wear. Eliminate LimeScale and other water issues like ground staining and bad odors with HydroCare water products available from Wave Home Solutions. Wave's affordable water systems don't use salts or chemicals. You'll love the way your water tastes, smells, and looks. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. More than a dozen astronauts have officially reported UFOs. UFOs. Hundreds of hours of UFO footage were filmed by astronauts aboard the space shuttle. Many of these UFOs can only be seen in ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light. Retired former Apollo astronauts and cosmonauts now tell their stories of their own personal UFO encounters. The Enigma Channel, intelligent television for planet Earth. EnigmaTV.com You're listening to the True Frequency Radio Network. No hate, no hype, no, 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 no fear. everybody. I'm here with Deborah Levine, First Forbes Trailblazer in Diversity. She's an award-winning author of 15 books and is the founder of an organization which we'll be talking about in this half hour. And so it's great to have you back and we can continue on the conversation we were having. Did you want to finish it up? Yes, absolutely. Remind me what we were talking about. Well, we were just basically talking, well, I guess we can just move on because it was kind of a general discussion. So I would really love to hear about your nonprofit and this organization that you founded. The American Diversity Report? Yes, I'm, I'm, I think that's an honorable, honorable uh, organization to, to start. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Uh, the American Diversity Report is uh, actually online. Uh, it has uh, been there for 15 years. And it collects submissions of articles by people from around the world and is, uh, has about a thousand of them up there available for free 
as a resource to people who are interested in the world of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, but also in terms of uh, doing good works mm-hmm. and making a difference. Mm-hmm. And now it is, it, it has uh, occasionally been a nonprofit. Right now, it is it is not. Uh, but uh, a lot of what we do is uh, just community based. Um, there have been uh, the, a podcast uh, for the past two years, which features people who make a difference, uh, giving them a voice, giving them mm-hmm. some ability to... Just uh, like me. That's what I like to do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know how that is. It's a passion. And it's something that, um, as I said, this has uh, gone on either in written form or in podcasts for 15 years. Uh, and it was... Uh, Originally, a uh, just a little newsletter, and many mentors have come to me to assist in making it into an online uh, magazine. Some uh, some people call it a blog, but it, it existed long before that word became popular. The um, the. <laughs> The technology behind it is done by me. <laughs> um, they, uh, I used to use the word um, uh, the expert on the web, um, and uh, but now I, I just say that I do the work. And one of the things that I haven't mentioned uh, in, in our interview in the, uh, so far is that I started studying computer programming back in the 1960s. Um, my mother informed me that I had to, whether I liked it or not, in high school because it was the future. You do what your mother says. And I actually became the IT manager of an office in the 1980s. So it seemed natural for me to go online and do this. Uh, and, and some people also call me a pioneer STEM uh, woman uh, because of, of my work in the computer world. Uh, and I have um, actually taught writing at a college of engineering and computer science for people like myself. Uh, it's it's so um, yeah. Go ahead. No, go. That is so surprising because we all know the position that women uh, held at that particular time. So that's a very progressive move at that point in time for the work you were doing at the time, also. Yes, it was. And and in fact, it was for the American Jewish Committee who had hired me to be their religious affairs director. And they were about to um, computerize the office. And my boss calls me in and says, I'm about to make you the IT manager. And they didn't didn't even have that title yet. And I, I said, why me? And he said, because there's nobody else in the entire office who's ever even used a computer. And so uh, <laughs> I became their first IT manager. And I had I had uh, not only studied it in high school, but uh, it was part of my urban planning degree uh, that you would uh, know how to use a computer. Uh, so I was uh, either very fortunate or really stuck. Uh, and I remember one day having to uh, be they talked me through it on the phone, dismantle the hard drive of a computer and clean it with the eraser of a number two pencil to get it working again. And it's it's been an interesting adventure. It's really interesting to see how at the speed of light this, this computer technology has gone forward at the time we're in right now. How did the men in your office and in that world receive you? Uh, it was interesting. Um, the um, <laughs> my boss was was male, and uh, he really pushed me to do perform more, take on more responsibilities again and again until it wore me out. Uh, it was amazing. And uh, I remember even in the beginning, uh, uh, as the religious affairs director sitting in my office wondering what I was supposed to do, uh, a, a gentleman appeared at my door. Uh, 
uh, a priest dressed as a priest. And uh, he says to me, you're going to need me. And I said, I don't know who you are, but I am sure you're right. And he mentored me, helped me. He was uh, attached to the Vatican. And, you know, he's still a friend all these years later. Mm. And, and I'm very grateful for the mentors that I had who saw in many times, in many ways, my potential before I even saw it and insisted in me going after it, whether I wanted to or not. <laughs> well, I have a question since we're going to, maybe we can delve into women's rights and the movement just for a bit here. Who was the most important woman in your life so far? Well, I always say it was my mother who um, went from being an island girl to also being at Harvard. And the two of us had similar paths in that. But she chose to be a pioneer in special education and was able to work with people at a level that was just extraordinary. Now, if I, I was very much like my dad, military, do this, do that, or else. And she gave me the people skills that have made me who I am today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she was a powerful woman in her own right. What about somebody else who is not a family member? Who would you consider? Not a family member. Um, uh, <clears throat> well, one person that comes to mind uh, is someone named uh, Dr. Nestle Alp. Uh, uh, she is still an administrator uh, in, the co in a college of uh, engineering and uh, computer science. She has been an engineer and she and I met up when I was doing uh, Women's History Month stories uh, and I, I asked to interview her uh, about her life coming from Turkey to mm -hmm. America as an engineer and into construction and becoming the interim dean at our university. And after that, uh, she asked to hire me to come on board to teach that technical writing and be in the office with her. Um, just an amazing experience, amazing woman who um, is, uh, has been a, really a model for so many women in the science, math, engineering, technology, mm -hmm. you know. If, yeah, even today, there's there really are not there are really not that many women in women in the field. I was watching a documentary about uh, Silicon Valley and just the low percentage of women that work in those fields. It was a, it was a bit extraordinary, actually. It is. It is, and there's there are many reasons for it. Uh, and uh, I have been working on this for many, many years and working with local organizations that encourage women to go into STEM fields um, in many ways, documenting them. I've, I've written articles, I've had them on t podcasts, uh, talking about what they do, how they do it uh, to inspire young women to go into these fields. Uh, it's not it's not a simple thing because they many people need uh, models that they can follow, and they often don't have them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like a mentor. Mm -hmm. Since again, since we're discussing women, what movements, in your opinion, have had the most impact for women today? That have uh, offered because of these certain events that have happened, it's opened the doors and given us opportunities. Yes. So I was there in 1970 in the first Women's Liberation March down in Manhattan, New York City, um, to protest uh, unequal pay, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and unequal access to opportunities. Uh, I can't say that we have finished the job, but... No, <laughs> I will agree with you. <laughs> not even close. Uh, but uh, especially these days when so many women have had to uh, remove themselves from the workforce to take care of families during COVID, um, mm -hmm. 
we're going to see a lot of uh, challenges here. Um, but it, but the idea that you could that women could actually stand up and be heard. Uh, not that everyone was happy to hear us, um, but it was something that just drew me to the point where I took a, a train from Harvard, Cambridge, you know, sort of in the middle of the night to arrive in New York on time to be part of this, um, and ever since. Uh, so I have created women's organizations along the way, one of them in particular here in Chattanooga, the Women's Council on Diversity, right after 9-11. Uh, to uh, not only to educate, but to heal community at large, not just for the women, but we have a nurturing role to play in the community as leaders uh, that I think has been underrated. And we need to step up and show that our leadership is key to the future. And when you think back, and I actually didn't even know this. This sounds funny. I, I'm part. I used to be part of a knitting club, and some of the women there were like ninety, up to hundred years old. Knitting must keep them young. And they told me stories from the previous century that just made my jaw drop. Like they had to wear school, skirts in school, and this is like just the middle of the century. It was just unbelievable, and just I, I just was in shock. And usually you were expected to be a teacher or a housewife, maybe a secretary, and that was it. That's what that's what was available. Well, I'll share with you that in growing up in Bermuda, we we had to wear dresses and uh, uniforms actually for school, and we were not allowed to wear black patent leather shoes because they might reflect what was up our skirts. So we were banned from wearing patent leather shoes I and mean, it was an interesting way to grow up and that was in the 50s and mm -hmm. so um I have been on campuses very conservative campuses speaking where and this was in the 80s I guess uh, I had to wear a dress no one wore pantsuits mm -hmm. no women wore pantsuits um it, it was uh um but I understood the way that if the thinking I didn't agree, but in order to be heard, I did wear the dress. Mm -hmm. And those women that I was referring to, they all wear pants now. Yeah. <laughs> They're like <laughs> jeans and pantsuits. Yeah, pants, no pants. <laughs> you know, my grandmother never wore pants a day in her life, but do not mess with her, I tell yeah. you. Yeah. Of There's some strong age. women out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so in addition to working with your organization, you've been involved with the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, Council Against Hate, Executive Committee, and Global Good, your Global Goodwill Ambassador. Yeah. That's fascinating. How do you find the time? What drives you? <laughs> I think I know the answer to what drives you. But uh, how do you have the time? How do I find the time? Um, sometimes I'm not sure of that myself. Uh, I have I've recently gotten uh, an award from the Women's Federation for World Peace mm -hmm. uh, for my work. Um, they find me, and I have trouble saying no. So they they do interviews like this with me, put them up on their uh, website to inspire people more. And that happens to me these days quite a bit. Um, the other the other organizations, uh, many times these days, you get to do it online, which makes it a little bit easier. Although uh, being, uh, you can get Zoom exhaustion quite easily. <laughs> yes, I understand that. But you don't have to wear pants or skirts. <laughs> exactly. You can wear a very nice sweater, right? And your pajamas pants. Uh, it's an interesting world. And as we come out of it, I'm curious to see, you know, how, how things are going to be. Um, the, the, the requests for me to, to speak about diversity and about women, um, religious diversity are, are not just double, but triple what they have been in the past. The need for to hear from me apparently is greater. Uh, and um, I call myself a diversity futurist. 
as in I part. like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> in part, you could see it coming. Um, the rapid change of the world, if for no other reason than the technology uh, that keeps uh, revving us up. Uh, so the, in, the invention I made after 9-11, the matrix model management system, uh, which teaches how to, t- to think differently, ad- be, being agile, flexible, uh, Im- embed emotional intelligence and um, the ability for what I call neurocommunication uh, is needed now more than ever. And so, I, I, frankly, I have to choose some things to do and others not uh, to make sure that I'm not spread too thin and that I make the biggest impact possible and assist where I can. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about your books. There were so many other topics I wanted to speak with you about, but we're running out of time. So let's okay. talk about your books. Okay, so there are 15 books. Most of them are how-to books. Uh, one of them, of course, is the Matrix Model Management System, and then the workbooks, which are uh, deal with uh, that system and unconscious bias. There are some on religious diversity with quick reference religious diversity cards in them. And then there are two memoirs, The, the Liberator's Daughter and the sequel, The Magic Marble Tree. And, mm-hmm. and frankly, of all the things that I've written, those were the two most difficult my story, mm-hmm. and what you can learn from my journey. Mm-hmm. I, I, I seem to have a grasp, and I'm, I'm sure the listeners do as well, about the challenges you have had. What are the silver linings of some of your failures and difficulties? The silver lining of some of the difficulties? Oh, gosh. I have been able to reinvent myself in ways that, as one of my friends said, I arrive early at the train station so others can come on time. Hmm. And what about future plans? What do you? What does the future hold for you? Oh my! Frankly, even though I'm not a spring chicken, uh, the best <laughs> is yet. <to> come. <laughs> I am uh, negotiating now with a variety of companies uh, to do uh, speaking uh, and uh, training, coaching uh, on diversity. Uh, I just did a wonderful presentation for Women's History Month for a university in New Mexico. I expect to be doing more of that. Uh, I am working on a script um, for a movie of my life that uh, is about half done uh, and looking forward to doing that this this summer Uh, and uh, the other thing that that I'm looking forward to is well uh, the I did create a black Jewish dialogue online to bring people together has always been part of me and to bring coalitions together teamwork to do major things in our lives in our communities so I'm doing it online also through the American Diversity Report which uh, is just growing every year oh it's just I love it I love what I do I'm passionate about it and I meet most amazing people in the process Mm -hmm. How oh, motivating and inspiring. You've been very inspiring to me. And will you let people know or share with people how they can find your books precisely, your websites? Are you on social media, which I imagine you are with your background? Uh, yes, I'm all over the place. Okay, so you can look at my American Diversity Report.com and you can see all of these articles, including many of my own. And you can see all my books on there, as well as some of the workshops and things that I do for people. You can also find all my books on Amazon, and you can see me on LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, and Twitter, also Pinterest and other places, uh, but I really enjoy uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, It's um, thousands of connections. Mm -hmm. We have a little more time, so 
I'm going to ask you an important question. What tips can you give to young girls or people with diverse ethnicities who want to become an entrepreneur like you? Okay, so the the entrepreneurial spirit, uh, if it's in you and you have that desire, is an amazing thing. Understand that it has creativity and innovation built in it, right? And it's just waiting to come blossoming out of you, right? So if that's something that uh, is inside of you, it's going to be a passion, and that's what helps make you an entrepreneur. Do your research about the products or services that you are interested in, so that you learn what other people are doing and then figure out what you can offer that's special. Mm -hmm. That's lovely. Do you feel positive about the future? In many ways, I do. <clears throat> in chaos theory, they say that the most creative pl place in the universe is at the edge of chaos. And frankly, for better or worse, that's where we are now. So all of you creative types, get going. This is your time. Mm -hmm. I love that. We just have to remember to, I know this sounds a little um, a little do-gooder-ish, but I really believe that you just have to focus on what is good, the simple things sometimes. Just take it day by day, do things that you love, make a difference. Just using your voice makes a difference. If you have strong beliefs and you're passionate about something, I, I encourage you to start speaking out. There's so many places to share information, so why not? If you were to do just one act of kindness a day, something small, right? Just, just one, right? Think of the legacy you're building and what you're passing on. Because mm -hmm. people do not realize that as they sit there, they're actually making history. You are history. Now, what you're going to do? Mm -hmm. And you have the power to change the course of, of the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if it's just one person or one small thing, use it. Don't mm -hmm. miss the opportunity. Yeah. And, well... Thank you so much for this interview. We may have a couple more seconds here. Let me check. But I am often inspired by people like you. That's why I'm excited to get to these interviews because what am I going to learn from this person? What can I share with others? So I, you know, I found you on LinkedIn. So social media is a, is a great way to connect to people of like mind. That's what it's for. Mm -hmm. That's the way. Mm -hmm. Use it. Use it well. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. I just want to say thank you to the owners of Truth Frequency Radio, and I'm glad everyone is here to, to listen, and I hope everyone's going to go do something fun after this. And I created a new website, so if everyone could take a look at it, and if you have children, no children, the technology that we have and the Internet of all things can take children down a dark path accidentally or just out of curiosity. So my new website is preventonlinebullying.org. Again, it's preventonlinebullying.org. And if you would like to take a, a look at some of my other interviews, you can go to YouTube and look up A Good Place with Ella, and you'll, get, you'll have the chance to listen to incredible people that have been so fortunate to interview. Okay. Uh, we still have a few more seconds. What do you know? I don't hear the commercials. But again, it's been a real pleasure. And hopefully you can come back in the future. I would love to. Let's uh, touch base maybe yes. six months or so and see what kind of things that have changed, how we plan to make a difference. Uh, I'm a planner by nature. Me too. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, planner, planner. That's how you get things done. You plan. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. It's been a real pleasure again. And I'll see you guys next week at the same time. Bye.